These first 11 chapters of the Bible show us the incredible degenerating effect that sin had on the human race. The very first family was torn apart by a brother murdering his brother. And it was over a religious matter. The world then became so violent and wicked that God had to cleanse the earth of man and start over with one man and his family. But after the flood, did things improve? Actually, no. Because then we come to this account of the building of the Tower of Babel. Sin was still in the heart of man, making him a rebel against God. God had told them, you see, that they were to spread out over the whole face of the earth and they weren't obeying God. Instead, they came together in the plain of Shinar and begin to build this city with this tower reaching to heaven. If left to itself, without divine grace, and without intervention from God, the human race would have continued in a downward spiral of depravity. It is only the restraint of God, a restraint which is kind of a common grace that he gives to all humanity, only that restraint keeps the world from descending into oblivion. Today, we have weapons that could literally destroy the human race. We have nuclear weapons that could actually destroy the world. And there are many people that are, are very afraid of that, of that actually happen, happening. Why hasn't it happened? Why hasn't someone pushed that nuclear button and, and then just started a nuclear war or something like that? It's God. God's restraining evil and destruction. God is, you, you might say God is making life tolerable. As intolerable as sometimes as life can be, if it weren't for God. See, there is, there, sin is a bottomless pit. If it is not checked, no one knows how far down sin can take humanity. If you study history, you will be shocked at some of the things that people have done. You study any history book and you'll come, away, you'll come away asking the question, how did these people do these wicked things? How did something like the Second World War ever happen? Millions of people were killed within a, a span of just about six years. How did a man called, named Hitler rise to power in Germany, which was the birth of the Protestant Reformation? How did that man manage to kill with, to gas six million Jews and a lot of other people as well. How did that ever happen? Some people actually don't even believe that it happened. It's so horrible, I think. A lot of people can't even bring themselves to believe that something like that actually happened. But it did. Because we don't know. See, you don't really know how far down right. sin can take you personally or the human race as a whole. It's a bottomless pit. We should remember this principle that unless God restrains man, there is no known limit to man's sinful capacities. Man seems to even be able to create new ways of doing evil. Sometimes it's almost, you look around at our culture, it's almost like people are saying, well, we broke all of God's commandments today. How can we break them all again tomorrow? It, it almost seems like people are, are doing that. They invent ways of doing evil, the scripture says. Now at times, God may express his wrath by giving people over to their sinful desires. This is actually stated in Romans chapter 1, verses 24 to 28. In those verses, Paul says that has a refrain that he mentions three times, and he gave them over, and he gave them over, and he gave them over. It's a scary, scary thing to think about. That if man rejects the knowledge of God, if man doesn't want God, then God may give man what he wants. And that's a scary, scary thing to think about. 
When God gives man over, man will suffer the natural and inevitable consequences of being without God and in slavery to passions. Paul's example, by the way, in Romans 1, of how the ancient world descended into sin included the sin of homosexuality, which is taking over Western civilization and our own culture. It may be a sign of divine abandonment. Now, now we, can, we, could, we could become very dark and morose and depressed, frankly, about the state of our own culture. But we have to remember, and the Bible is teaching us this, right here in the first chapters of Genesis, that God has continued to guide the development of human history, and God has not deserted the world. Now, I know there are those who might question that statement, because if we look around at our world and we see the chaos, we could perhaps draw the conclusion that God has withdrawn. But the scripture teaches us that even though God may at times express his wrath, God has never completely taken his hand off the wheel and let things spin out of control. In fact, God has ordered human life so that men can seek him. This is what Paul said in his sermon in Athens. God is governing history not for the physical comfort of man, but for the spiritual development of the race. Acts chapter 17, verses 26 and 27, Paul said this in his sermon in Athens, and, and he, that's God, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. By the way, that's what they weren't doing at Babel. That's why he scattered them. To live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God. God has his hand on human history. God has his hand on the nations of the world to arrange life in such a way that people will seek him. That's what Paul is saying. God's not uninvolved at all. Not at all. That they should seek God and perhaps fill their way toward him and find him, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. Now Paul says that men should seek God and that they can seek God. He doesn't say that they actually do seek God. In fact, the story of humanity shows us that men have not been seeking God, but God has been seeking men. God has not left himself without a witness. He's given some revelation to all men, to every nation, and God is going to hold people responsible for the knowledge that they had available to them. God's not going to judge people unfairly. He's going to judge them according to the light that they had available to them. And so for those of us who live in the full light of the gospel, we have a great responsibility and to whom much is given, much will be demanded. If if God were not involved with the world, the world could not be sustained. The idea that God made the world to run on its own scientific laws is not a biblical idea. That's, a, that's an idea of men. That's a modern idea. It's not a biblical idea. If God were to withdraw completely, from, even for a moment, from this world, the result would be that the world would return to its primordial chaos, darkness, and emptiness. The word that created the world also upholds it. He upholds it, it says in, in Hebrews chapter 1, by the word of his power. And so the first chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 through 11, give us a picture of a world that is trending back towards the primordial chaos and darkness, except for the fact of God's intervention. If, if it weren't for God, the world would slip back into the primordial chaos and darkness and non-being of creation uh, before, as, as it was before God spoke the world into existence. Now from this account of the Tower of Babel, we learn several lessons. First of all, we learn 
that the agenda of man is inherently flawed and wicked. The agenda of man is inherently flawed and wicked. Now, so they got together to build this city and build this tower. And an, an ignorant person might read this account and say, why was God so upset about this? It, it's, it seems, at first it seems harmless. They're just getting together for a building project. They're going to build themselves a city and they're going to build themselves a tower. What, what's wrong with that? Is, is God against architecture? I mean, we, we have some men here who build things. Is God, is God against building things? No. Is God not in favor of human progress? Is God not in favor of us making our lives better? In our modern world, Christianity has often been painted as the great hindrance to human progress. Didn't we call the period of history ruled by the church the dark ages? This is, this is things that unbelievers say. Didn't the church persecute the great scientists like Galileo who were, who were trying to make advancements and make life better for the human race? See? And so we, today we have this modern war between science and religion. It's probably epitomized by the famous Scopes monkey trial and the debate between evolution and creation. And so many unbelieving people have accused God's people of sort of hindering human progress. And someone who doesn't have a lot of understanding, you can read this account of the Tower of Babel, and you can, you can come away saying, you know, is God just, does God just want us to live as uncivilized is God against human civilization well so you have to do a little bit uh, you have to dig a little deeper to find out why God was so displeased with the building of this city and this tower because I'm going to say God is not against civilization per se but there was something going on with the builders of this city and this tower that he was not pleased with that he actually said he had to stop. And I, I would argue that, that every time humanity has tried to rebuild this tower, God has stopped it again and again over and over throughout human history. One of the great goals of humanists and secularists is to get everyone together, get everyone united for the advancement of the human race. This is preached by the world. If we could all just get along, if we could all just get together... Boy, we could eradicate hunger, we could eradicate war, we could make ourselves a utopia, a perfect world. This is why the United Nations was founded, to bring the world together for the advancement of the human race. That's exactly what happened at Babel. That actually happened. They all had one common speech. They were all together in the same place. There was unity. The world would say, this is, a, this is a great thing. This is a great start. This is exactly what we need, but God wasn't pleased. Why wasn't God pleased? Doesn't God want unity? Doesn't God want people to get together, to be reconciled to one another? Well, yes, He does. But a humanity that is united is not a good thing if the agenda is ungodly. In fact, God is really more concerned about the unity of the human race than he is about his diversity. In other words, God begins to get concerned about what's going on when people are united, not when, they're di not when there's diversity. Diversity is not necessarily a bad thing. It may actually be something that, that is sent from God. What really gets God's attention, if you will, is when man, wicked men get together and have unity. That's what gets God's attention. And so God, when there is this godless agenda of men coming together, that is something God will always oppose. And He has kept the nations perpetually confused and divided usually suspicious of each other and going to war against each other, so that what happened at Babel does not happen again. 
Even so, the ungodly still gather together against the Lord and His Christ. If God did not continue to stop the building of the city of man, then be assured the world would unite and make a united effort to cleanse the world of every follower of Jesus Christ. They would do it. At one time, the greatest empire in history that ruled the entire civilized world made an attempt to stamp out, stamp out Christianity. Rome tried to stamp out the church in the period following the apostolic age. Rome tried to stamp out the church, and they failed to do so. But as the end approaches, God may begin to take away what restrains wickedness, and we may see more of a united effort from the world against believers. So the world preaches peace and harmony and unity, but on its own terms and without God or God's agenda. The world wants all of the good things that, God, that can only come from the hands of God, but they do not want God himself. So everybody's pursuing the good life, see. All the nations of the world, they want peace and plenty, and they want all these things. Those are all things that can only come from the hand of God, but they don't want it from God. They don't want God himself. They want the blessings of God without the agenda of God. That's what's wrong with the world in a nutshell. It is wrong to have unity at the expense of the truth of God. Now, we often hear denominational church leaders talk about Christian unity. And there is a dangerous willingness in the institutional church to throw the word of God and the truth of the gospel out the window just to have some kind of institutional unity. That's the spirit of Babel. Let's get together. Let's have unity. Well, what about the truth? What about, what about God? Well, you know, we can't seem to agree on that. So we'll just, we'll just ignore God so that we can have what we want. See, that's Babel. That's the spirit of, ba of Babel. And it, it, it will never be, it cannot be blessed by God. It will never be blessed by God. God does want to give unity. Don't make... Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. God wants to bring people together, but on His terms and in His way. We will have unity with one another when we are all submitted to the reign of God. That's how unity, real unity happens. Now it's important that God's people not unite with the wicked or help with their plans and goals. If Babel is being rebuilt in our day, it is vital that we refuse to pick up a single brick in support and solidarity. That's right. Amen. We're not going to help them build Babel. That's right. This is why Christians who want to get involved in politics have to be very, very, very yeah. discerning lest they find themselves with some strange bedfellows. Now, we cannot completely withdraw from life in the world, or we would have to physically leave the world. But we can refuse to be involved in those systems that have come out against God. This is precisely why many Christian people cannot support the public education system in this country. Neither can we support corrupt Christian institutions, even though they wear the name of Christ, which actually in many ways is a worse perversion even than the secular institutions. We're simply not going to support an agenda that goes against God or excludes God. Amen. 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 Now, secondly, Babel represents all of mankind's efforts to order life without God. This is, this is man coming together saying, here's what we want to do, but nobody consulted the Lord. Uh -huh. Nobody got together and said, what can we do to glorify God? That wasn't on the, the meeting agenda for ba the building of Babel. If you could have seen, on a, if they had a meeting agenda for, for the building of Babel, one of the items was not, let's pray and ask God what he wants us to do. That was not on the agenda for Babel. So, so here's man coming together. They're saying, how can we get the advantage for ourselves? How can we build our lives and and... Basically, they're creating civilization 
But, but they're doing it without God. This is, this is secularism. This is humanism. Man at the center, God is not, not in their thoughts at all. Now, God is not against building or even against human beings harnessing the power of natural resources in order to make life better. God's not against those kinds of things. God is not even against civilization, per se. Men are made in the image of God. We were, man was set to rule over what God had made. The building of the tower, however, and this tower in this city, was a human agenda made without God in mind. Anything that is good becomes evil if it is not done unto the Lord. Amen. Yes. So is there anything wrong with building a city? Is there, is there anything wrong with trying to create a civilization or, or culture, if you will? Not in and of itself, but anything that is good becomes evil if not done. Even the plowing of the wicked is sin. Amen. See? So what, whatever, it is that the, whatever it is that wicked people do, if it's done for their own ends without God in mind, it's wicked. Amen. Even if the thing itself that they're doing isn't in and of itself wicked. Amen. It is, having said that, it is interesting. If you keep reading the book of Genesis, it's, it's very interesting that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob always lived in tents, not in cities. Lot, what did Lot do? Lot went down to Sodom. Big mistake. Just something to think about. Even when the Israelites came back to Canaan, and they were, they were going to possess the cities of the Canaanites, they were going to take over a civilization. Possessing cities that they didn't build. Remember what he says? You're going to possess cities you didn't build. You're going to reap from vineyards that you didn't plant. God's going to be very good to you. God warned them in Deuteronomy 8, when this happens, be careful that you don't forget God. This, see, this, this accumulation of wealth and prosperity and civilization has caused men to forget God. The prosperity of human cities or civilizations has been one of the major forces throughout history, causing men to forget God, focusing inst instead on all of the distractions that our world has to offer. I mean, who needs God? We have TV and we have the NFL. And so our civilization has all of these pleasures, all of these distractions. You can go out and go to the movie. You can go out and eat at your favorite restaurant. You can stay home and watch 259 channels on television. Entertainment, see? This is all part of human, what human civilization has brought us. Yeah. Are any of those things wrong in and of themselves? Not necessarily. But see, people are into these things and they're not seeking God. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. We should not make our plans for life without thinking of God and His will. Amen. This is a warning even for believers while still in the world. Listen to this, James 4, 13 to 16. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. Yes. Amen. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, yeah, that's right. we will live. Yeah. Yeah, you, you might not yeah. live yeah. tomorrow. Yes. But if the Lord wills, first of all, we'll live, and then we'll do this or that. Yeah. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. This is actually the pride of life that John's talking about in 1 John 2. All such boasting is evil. That's James 4, 13 to 16. So if you make your plans for life without God at the center, you are committing the sin of Babel, and God will come down and destroy your plans. I think all of us uh, who are in adulthood now have probably had this uh, experience where we've wanted to do something, and we didn't really consult God, and we, didn't really cons we weren't really concerned about God, and we went off and did it, and it failed miserably. All such boasting is evil. 
The fool lives as if there is no God. Or the f- foolish people live as if God doesn't really see what they're doing. See, we'll just build this tower in this city. And this describes our generation perfectly. There's a disturbing lack of consciousness of God in people today. That reminds us a lot of the generation that started building Babel. Believers, on the other hand, are to pray for His kingdom to come and His will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that starts with our own lives when we pray that. When we pray to God, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, we're praying, first of all, that it's done in us, in me. Has God's rule and reign come to your life? Is His will being done in you? Until that happens, there will be nothing of lasting significance accomplished for the Lord in our generation. And you won't be able to do anything significant for the Lord until in your own life and in your own heart, the kingdom has come and His will is done in you. That's, I say that because that's the opposite of the spirit of Babel. See? His kingdom coming, his will being down on earth as it is in heaven, that's the opposite of the spirit of Babel. This building was wrong because it was for the glory of God rather than the it was for the glory of man rather than the glory of God. The builders of Babel were competing with God. That's why their project was doomed to failure from the beginning. Man was made in the image of God to be God's agent on earth and to further God's reign, not his own agenda. Man was not made to act independently of God and take the world for his own. But that's what they're doing at Babel. In fact, this desire to be God was part of the first temptation to sin. You will be like God. And it has... And it has remained at the very heart of man's sinful nature. Sin is man's attempt to be God, removing him from the throne and putting ourselves there instead. Sin is cosmic rebellion. It started with Satan in heaven, and Satan has done everything he can to spread his rebellion on earth in man. And so the Bible teaches us in incidents like Babel that all of this cosmic rebellion is futile. It's not going to succeed. It's very important that we don't become a part of Satan's losing cause. Don't join the wrong team. Join the winning team. See, this is the time to take sides now. All sin falls short of God's glory. We were made to reflect the glory of God, not to compete with it or attempt to suppress it, but that is exactly what the world does following in the footsteps of the people at Babel. God's purpose is to make himself known. That's what glory is. Glory is when God is made known. God's purpose is to glorify himself, to make himself known, to make his name known in the earth. That's God's desire. That's God's purpose. But the people at Babel wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted to be famous. Not to further the knowledge of God in the earth. They wanted to be famous. And in the heart of every man is a desire to promote himself and to be known by others who honor and respect them. This is how the world works. This is what makes the world run. People want other people to honor them. That's what it means to make a name for ourselves. I want to make a name for myself. I want other people, when they hear my name, I want other people to go, wow, he's really successful, he's really smart, he's he's really good looking, he's really got it going on. And organizations do the same thing. Organizations want other people to go, wow, that company, they're really, they really had a good year. There's some really smart people over there. Churches do this. Wow, look at that building program they got going on. That church is really successful. See, people crave that from other people. They want that. They live for that kind of praise. Just like the Pharisees. John said the Pharisees love the praise of man. More than the praise of God. And I'll tell you something. There's not a person in this room who isn't susceptible to that temptation. 
Don't think for a moment that you're not susceptible to this. There is something in every single person's heart here in this room that we want to hear other people talk well about us, and that makes us feel really good, see? And that, that it sounds innocent, but it isn't. That's the very heart of the sin of Babel. Make a name for ourselves. This building also included technological advancements. They found a way to get these bricks out of the earth. They made these bricks out of the earth. It seems like this hadn't been done before. I'm, I'm guessing at that. But it seems like the text is kind of hinting that, that this is something that wasn't done before. They, they made bricks and bra- baked them thoroughly. Wow, this is, this is like the invention of the wheel or the first microcomputer chip, you know. New technology. But it was used for wicked purposes. What this is, is this is man perverting the abilities that God gave him. See, God has given man the ability to, to invent things, to make things, to make new things, to use the resources of the earth. God get, Where did that ability come from? It came from God. All of the scientific advancements that we've had in our modern world, God has given us the ability to do that. But what man does is he takes those abilities and he uses them for his own ends and he perverts what God has given. Again, God is not against technology. We are using technology. We don't believe that God is against technology. But God knows what wicked man is capable of doing. What did he say about the people of Babel? If if they can do this, nothing will be impossible for them. God knows the capabilities of men made in his image, fallen though they are. We are made in his image, and the higher the creature, the greater the fall. Men make atomic bombs, not monkeys. The higher the creature, the greater the fall. God knows this. You see, man is a a servant. Man is a steward and will be held accountable to God for what he has done with God's stuff. This is God's stuff. This is not our stuff. Everything we have is a gift from God. It's not our own to use for ourselves and for our own ends. It's vital that we use all of our resources, gifts, and abilities for God. Because it all came from God, and, we're all, and He's going to hold us accountable for how we used it. Now, the Lord does expect His people to work and to increase what He has given. He expects, he expects us to use all of our creative and mental and physical capacities. God is not against work. Or innovation. In fact, God's people should be the hardest working, the most industrious, Mm -hmm. and the most innovative people on the planet. So we're we're not against, Mm -hmm. see, using what God has given us. But we are against using it for our own ends. The building of the Tower of Babel probably also included an idolatrous religious purpose. In fact, many scholars believed they were actually building two things. They were building a city with a tower. And most scholars believe that this, this tower, we think of a tower like a, big, like a big cylindrical thing, like a silo or something going straight up. But actually, it was probably uh, like a terraced building. It was something called a ziggurat. Uh, we, the ancient Sumerians built these structures called ziggurats, and they would build a, a large square down here and then a smaller square on top and a smaller square on top all the way up. And at the top, that was where they worshipped the sun, the moon, and the stars. And offered human sacrifices too, by the way. So they they were building this tower reaching to the heavens. Remember it says, we want to build a tower to the heavens. Why? Because they were worshipping the heavens. By heavens, I I don't mean the heaven where God lives. They weren't worshipping God. They were worshipping the sun, the moon, and the stars. They were, they, were, they were worshiping the creation rather than the creator. 
That's idolatry, the ultimate sin of the human race. An idol, by the way, is any good thing that becomes an ultimate thing. Now, God made the sun, the moon, and the stars. Are the sun, the moon, and the stars somehow inherently wicked? No. But if you worship them, it's idolatry. Everyone is religious. Don't let anybody tell you they're not religious. Everyone's religious about every Everyone worships. Do you know that there are millions of Americans today who spent the whole day worshiping? Not in church. They spent the whole day worshiping at home, watching the NFL. I'm not against the NFL. I know this is the second time I've mentioned the NFL. I, I, I enjoy watching a football games just like any other American male, I suppose. It's a good thing that becomes an ultimate thing. That's an idol. Idolatry is not innocent. It's not an innocent mistake to worship idols. It comes from man's desire. Idolatry comes from man's desire for moral freedom. They do not want to be accountable to God. And so I'll create, I'll, I'll create a God that I don't really have to be accountable to. I don't, the sun, the moon, and the stars really don't demand anything from me. See, the, the, you know, the, the, the things that people worship today, they worship these things because they can, whenever they're done with it, they can just leave it. It, it, it doesn't demand anything from, from us. Behind all false religion is an attempt to manipulate and to control life rather than to submit and trust. It's no accident that after the example of Babel, we have the calling of Abraham. The man known for his faith, his trust in God, which is the exact opposite of what was going on at Babel. In the same way, we're children of Abraham, see? We're, we're to be different from the world, from those in the world, with all of their anxiety and running to and fro after material wealth. Jesus says, don't be like the pagans. Trust God to supply what you need in the world as you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Again, that's, that's the opposite of the spirit of Babel. Now, Babel also shows us that God thwarts the purposes of wicked men. God thwarts the purposes of wicked men. And God has kept doing this throughout history as other towers were attempted right up to our present time. The lesson of Babel is that God will not allow wickedness to ultimately succeed. This does not mean that evil men will not arise from time to time, sometimes even persecuting the saints of God. We will suffer evil in the world, but the ultimate victory is assured. I love this part of the account. It says, and God came down to see the tower. Now this is the closest thing in the Bible to humor. This is the closest thing in the Bible you'll, you'll find to a joke. It's not, it's not a silly joke, though. It's sardonic humor. This is what you would call divine scorn. This is, very, this is, this is a comment that God had to come down to see the tower. Think about this now. It's, God, it's, it's almost as if God is saying, now where is that tower that they're built? Oh, there it is. I'm going to have to get on a cloud and go down just to see this little thing. Now, they didn't think it was little. But this is divine scorn. It's the same, that, that's going, same thing that's going on in Psalm 2. Where it says, uh, all the wicked gather together, you know, let us throw off his fetters. And the one enthroned in heaven laughs. <laughs> just go ahead and try. It's, it's kind of funny, actually, when you think about it. Man, try, man trying to dethrone God is funny. It's not funny like ha-ha silly funny. It's, it's like this is ridiculous funny. God laughs in scorn at man's attempt to overthrow his rule. In fact, those building the Tower of Babel are called the children of men. Babel was child's play. Like a bunch of kids playing in the dirt, thinking that they're doing something really important. This is from God's perspective. 
Where is that tower now? Oh, there it is. I'm going to have to go down just to see this thing. Whatever is valuable and impressive to man is a worthless abomination to God. And people who don't know God are much too easily satisfied and impressed with worldly things. If you don't know God, you will be overawed by worldly things. You'll be too impressed by man if you don't know God. Man's greatest need is to be humbled. We remember the example of Nebuchadnezzar puffed up with pride as he looked out on his city of Babylon. Is not this great Babylon, he said, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. And Nebuchadnezzar had to go to seminary for seven years. Solomon said pride, and he ought to know, Pride comes before a fall. Christian thinkers have always said that pride is the most deadly of sins, which also brought Satan down to the earth. Man cannot successfully compete with or thwart God's purpose. God does whatever he wants in the world and easily, easily removes men who oppose him. This is why we should never fear man. This account illustrates that wicked man cannot do all that he will, but is limited by divine sovereignty. No, so much for free will. I mean, people talk about the free will of man. If man, is a, if man has a free will, then why wasn't Babel finished? Man just can't do whatever he wants. That's a ridiculous idea. These people that say this, those kinds of things need to have their heads examined. Man is really not free when he's alienated from God. Amen. We should not fear or envy wicked men because their time is limited. The writer of the, of the 72nd or 73rd Psalm, I believe, said that the, the feet of the wicked are set in slippery places. Yeah. Yeah. And just when you think this, this wicked person is really, really successful and nothing can stop them, they, whoop, they slip and they're, and they're done. So don't envy the wicked. Amen. Their, their, their time is, is limited. God has placed the limitation of vanity on human life. That's what the whole book of Ecclesiastes is about. Life is like a child at the beach trying to build sandcastles that are washed away by the rising surf. Everything man builds is washed away. And falls to the ground. It's important for us to realize this. In our own efforts to build our lives here in the world, this world is in a state of passing away. Nothing we build here is going to last. God thwarted man's purpose because he has a purpose of his own for the world. When God does not give us what we want, it is because he has something better for us. God giving people what they want can be the worst thing that ever happened to them. So the purpose of God will begin with the call of Abram. It's a promise to bless the world through him and his seed, which is Christ. Instead of building towers of Babel, we should be pursuing the blessing of God at all cost. In contrast to the promise of blessing in chapter 12 through Abraham, Babel is cursed by God. Do you see that? We have blessing and cursing right here, side by side. Babel's cursed. Abraham's, God says to Abraham, I'll bless through you. See, you, you want the blessing of God? You've got to get it his way. Not your way, his way. See, the world's trying to get blessed their own way. See, that's, that's Babel. So a lot, of, a lot of connections here. The twin forces of confusion and dispersion, dispersion throughout human history are signs of God's curse and wrath. Twin forces, confusion, that's what Babel means, and dispersion. It says he confused their languages and he scattered them. Confusion, dispersion. Confusion, dispersion. This is God's wrath 
These are twi like twin forces that describe all of human history. Now, God is typically not the author of confusion when it is his work. Yeah. Remember, Paul said to the Corinthians, God's not the author of confusion. But then you go to Babel and you say, well, God caused this confusion. What, what's going on here? When it's his work, there's not confusion. But when, but when God is judging man's evil work, one of the ways that he judges is through confusion. And then pss, dispersion. The result of sin is dispersion, being cast out, being exiled. Babel is really a reenactment on a larger scale of what happened to Adam and Eve when they sinned. And they were cast out dispersed out of the Garden of Eden. That's the story of the human race. God is still angry with the wicked every day, and nobody gets away with anything. Everyone reaps what they sow. Now finally, the spirit of Babel endures in our world today. In fact, the degeneration of the early world may be a picture of the degeneration of the world at the end of time which will set the stage for the return of Christ and the commencement of the new creation. It's no accident that immediately after God dealt with Babel, he called Abraham out of Ur and the new creation began. The world will end in much the same way that it began. In spite of man's growing wickedness, God will intervene and make a new creation. The days before Christ's return will be like the days of Noah. We expect an increase of wickedness as one of the signs of the end. There will be a rise there will be the rise of the man of sin who is the antichrist and strong delusion in the last days. The rise of Babel in the early wor world precipitated the rise of spiritual Babylon in the modern world. Babel is translated everywhere everywhere else in the scriptures as Babylon and becomes a type and a shadow of the wickedness of the world system and its corrupt religion that is a satanic counterfeit of the Lord's Christ. In the end, Satan will be set loose to make one last desperate attempt at destroying God's work, but will himself be destroyed. Perhaps the gathering of Satan's forces for this last stand has already begun in our time, just as the men begin to gather in the plains of Shinar to build this city and its infamous tower. The spirit of Babel endures in our world today. Babel is the world and its lusts and pride. We are not to love the world, John said, and its preoccupations with lusts and pride in possessions, 1 John 2, 15 to 17. The spirit of the world is not of God, and is an opposition to God. The world is not neutral. It is moving in a certain direction away from God. And apart from salvation in Christ, we will all be subject to the course of this world. Right. Babel is the spirit of all false religion. Even that which wears the name of Christ. False religion is really just worldliness in disguise. Yeah. It's just worldliness with a religious cloak. When the church commits adultery with the world and is unfaithful to God, she gets intimate with the world and compromises her holiness, becoming like the world rather than reflecting the glory of God. False religion is that which man builds and does not have a divine origin. The spirit of Babel, let's make this real personal as we wind this down. The spirit of Babel is simply living a selfish life without a consciousness of God. Men are basically selfish and will remain so unless there is some divine grace that intervenes. Outside of Christ, see, all of us were selfish. And this, but this selfishness is often disguised and hidden. This can be hard to detect. We, we make our plans. We never, we never think that our plans are selfish, see. But that part of our nature that tends to be selfish, to not think about God... And to repeat the sin of Babel, that has to be put to death. Yes. Amen. And so instead of living according to the selfish desires of the flesh, we are called to be a part of what God is building. Ah, God is building something. Yeah. It's almost as if God says, step aside, man. I'm going to build something now. Amen. Jesus is building his church. And these members of his church will be from out of all the nations scattered at Babel. After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number. 
from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. That's God's project. That's what God's building. At Babel, the nations were confused and were scattered. At Pentecost, the gospel was preached in many tongues or languages, and people were gathered in. And as Daniel saw, the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands will crush all earthly kingdoms, all Babel, all Babylons and all towers of Babel, and will fill the whole earth. God is building a city for his people, a city with foundations whose builder and maker is God. The, the, the city of man will be judged and will be destroyed. God has prepared a city with foundations. It's permanent. Yes. For his people who have been strangers and aliens in this world, and we should be satisfied with nothing less. Don't settle for anything less than what God is preparing for his people. Amen.